Jocelyn Zuckerman, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be yeah. here with you. Yeah. So we, we haven't seen each other for, I guess, for about a decade almost. Um, and before we, that, probably three decades. Yeah, we go, we, we, we go way back. Right? <laughs> so Columbia High School and, and I think South Orange Junior, Junior High. High, too. Yeah, I, I think we go back to seventh grade. Yeah. I think we're in all the same classes. Yep. And of course, since you were a girl, I was intimidated by you. So I, <laughs> we probably didn't speak much. And we probably yeah, spoke and since, you were, since you were so smart, I was intimidated by you. Oh, well, so we, so we, we, we both bring baggage to, <laughs> to our we conversation. Lot, we had a lot of classes together. I think we were in like math and history classes together for, for years. Yeah. Right? Yep. Miss O'Flaherty, yeah. we were in English class together. I don't think I had Miss O'Flaherty. You didn't Miss O'Flaherty? Really? No. Was that junior high? That was junior high, yeah. I thought you were in that class. Gosh, maybe. I, I can't remember nun. who I did have, so it's possible. She was a former nun. She was really badass, and but she was very good in terms of teaching us grammar and writing. Oh, maybe so. I think you were in that class. Is that is that the one where the uh, the drama teacher came and had us do read a poem? As you like it. Well, I think we had to we had to pick a poem to perform. I'm not sure. And oh, Mrs. Man. Curtin, you were certainly in that. You yep. were in the Continental yep. Congress with us, right? Yep, two years of Mrs. Mm -hmm. Curtin. <laughs> yeah. As as I reflect that, we were strangely well educated. We were. We had some good classes. And those uh, those AP history classes were good, I think. Right. Mr. Little. Mr. Yep. Spear. Can you imagine the you know those guys teaching today with the kind of uh, no they were so surveillance and oversight and yeah. anti wokeness yeah. right totally I know so. we have a friend who's a, um who who was a teacher in in New York City very you know very lefty guy but he said it's just like um everyone's so paranoid about everything that they're saying that it's just gotten to be a very um, mm -hmm. fraught environment which is kind of a shame but. Yeah. I mean, maybe also good that people's people's feelings are being taken into consideration that were never taken into consideration in the past, right? <laughs> right. Well, you know, it's, it's almost a, a segue to your book, which um, I don't think could be taught in most <laughs> public schools in most states um, because it tries to tell the truth about uh, colonialism and and, you know, the history of the last you know, two, two, three hundred years in, in a way that like it's it's really hard to read. It's hard to argue with. Um, so maybe we should just <laughs> give give our give our listeners a little context. You wrote this book, I guess, about a, a year ago. It came out now called Planet Palm, how palm oil ended up in everything and endangered the world. Um, before we get into it, maybe, you know, tell us about your life since since high school. <laughs> just give us a. You know, introduce yourself to my listeners. Okay, so um, I went to college in upstate New York at Hamilton College. I studied um, English and French literature. I spent a year, my junior year, at the in Paris studying French literature, literature at the Sorbonne. Huh. Came back and um, after college, I, I taught English for a year, uh, high school students English in Hoboken, New Jersey, actually for a year, and then I moved to magazines and had a couple jobs. Um, at being an editor and writing for magazines. At a certain point, I decided I had I thought about um, Peace Corps when I was in college, but I felt like I wanted to see if I could sort of make it in the workforce first. So I then when I was 26, I thought, OK, I want to do this. So I went to um, ended up in Kenya with the Peace Corps, um, lived in a little village for two years teaching English and math. So that I think the, the seeds of this book, Planet Palm, are, are really in that time because it was, a, um, it was an agricultural community. It was very sort of um, poor, remote, um, and just kind of opened my eyes to the way that most of the world lives. Um, came back from there thinking that I wanted to be an African correspondent, so I went to um, journalism school at Columbia and then came out of there. Had since gotten involved with a guy who um, would become my husband who was not interested in moving to... Um, anywhere in Africa, basically. So I sort of shifted shifted to sort of cultural um, reporting and I ended up at Gourmet Magazine where I, where I was for 12 years as an editor. Um, 
it was great at a certain point, um, Ruth Reichel came on as the editor in chief. She had been the, uh, the food critic for the New York Times and she was sort of an old hippie. She had lived in a commune in Berkeley and just, um, I mean, Gourmet, when I first went, there had been sort of this, this old, a little, little bit uptight magazine, Condé Nast magazine, um, uh, very kind of formulaic for a, for a wealthier audience. And Ruth came and she really sort of opened up, you know, what a, what a food magazine could do. And so we got to do m much more political stuff. I got to bring on a bunch of great writers. Um, and so I was there for 12 years, ended as deputy editor and finally left only, I mean, it was, it was a great place, but only because I sort of felt like I wasn't learning that much anymore. And I, and I wanted to get back to sort of more environmental stuff, more political stuff. So I went freelance with a couple um, stints at magazines. I worked at a magazine called On Earth, which was published by the Natural Resources Defense Council. So I worked there as an editor for about a year, and then I then I worked as a writer for them. I also worked at um, Modern Farmer, which was a, a magazine. I think it's now only online, but it was a good magazine for a while. Um, anyway, and then and then focused on freelance writing. And one of the pieces I did was. Um, I pitched it to that magazine on Earth about uh, land grabs, and I went to report it in Liberia, got down on the ground and saw that all this land grabbing had to do with palm oil. And several months, several years later, I published the book, and here we are. Right. right. Hey, just um, your audio is coming in a little soft for me. I don't know if there's anything you can do to... Like turn, uh, I don't know. What do I do? Um, I don't know, either a knob or a button or closer to the microphone or shout. <laughs> if, if not, I'm sure we can, I'm sure get, we can do something in post. Is this better? Um, you know, actually that there was one comment on that Adam um, Ragusea YouTube thing saying that my sound was really bad. I don't, I don't know why I've got a, I mean, it's a MacBook Pro and it's a couple of years older. Oh. Uh. I well, know. I don't know. Just you know, maybe a little, a little closer to the microphone, and we want to. We def we definitely want okay, to platform I've you. Just moved in. Okay. Great. Now my okay. head's more on your level. Yeah, I mean, I can definitely better? hear you, so I'm sure I can equalize somehow. Like... But yeah, it doesn't look like I don't. I don't know what to do. Sorry. Okay. Well, they just just project. <laughs> Okay. Mr. Schertzer, that was the guy who who was Scherzer teaching us how that? to do how to um, how to recite poetry. Oh, I didn't have him. Oh, he just came in for two weeks in some some English teacher's class. We were we we stopped doing uh, sentence diagramming and we did. Oh, sentence diagramming! Forgot that was yeah, Warreners. <laughs> All right. Well, the, the mind is you know, the middle-aged mind is doing amazing things. <laughs> um, so you open the book with the story of um, reporting that that land grab in Liberia, and you, you mentioned that you start the book in a way that you did you you didn't dare to start the magazine article, which is Kurt Cobain's song "Rape Me," right, playing in your ears as a kind of a an organizing metaphor for what you saw. Yeah. So what did you see? And it was absolutely true. I really, I really did. It was, it, it was so brutal what I was seeing. That really was the song that was, that was pounding in my head, but I knew my, my editors would just be like, come on, come on, Jocelyn, enough with the, um, the rape metaphor. <laughs> but um, I just saw this landscape that was devastated. And there's a picture in the book, um, you know, they, they just cut down this, this um, oil palm company had, had cut down, tropical rainforest for for miles and miles i mean it was just just like a wasteland um and the people i talked to said you know we've we've lived here for generations we got our we got our fish and our water and our small hunted for small animals and all of our um vegetables and fruits and our building materials everything from the forest and now it's gone now we're just marooned here what do we do get jobs with the oil palm company which are not well paid and uh kind of brutal in every way. Um, right. And you said you, you wrote, you know, that article and you won after you published it, you wondered like, had you missed a bigger picture? Were you overdoing the talk about palm oil? Maybe this was a, um, an anomaly. Um, what did you do? What did you do then? Cause like one, one of the things I just want to say about the book is that 
it was really hard for me to read. And I say that not in a way that I want to discourage other people from reading it, but it's, it's you know, the, you, you discuss a lot of brutal stuff. And I can't even imagine what it must have been to write. And, but at some point you're like, I've, I've got to explore this in detail. What did, so what did you, what did you then do to, to start the whole process of, of researching this book? So, yeah, I mean, I, I felt so strong about the whole thing um, coming back from that Liberia trip. But, yeah, I thought, you know, I'm, as I say, I'm sort of this parachuting in journalist. You know, I'm, I'm based in New York. And could I have missed the bigger picture or could this have been, as you said, an anomaly? Um, so I started basically pitching, mag you know, I didn't know I was going to do a book at that point. But I thought this palm oil stuff is very interesting and sort of nobody's talking about it. So I started pitching magazine story, you know, stories to other magazines so that um, mainly I would get myself to Indonesia and Malaysia. And because um, that's the, um, for your listeners, 85% of the palm oil today is produced in Indonesia and Malaysia. So I wanted to get over there and, um, you know, see what it looked like in that context and talk to workers and talk to villagers. And um, yeah, and I saw basically the same thing. And then I got myself to... Um, Guatemala and um, Brazil, Honduras, and, and and did was hearing the same stories over and over. Um, so I felt I felt like okay, I you know I don't think I got that Liberia story wrong, and in fact this is probably a bigger a bigger story than I even realized. Hmm. Uh, so let's let's um, have a little background for people before we get into the the story. So what what is palm oil? So palm oil is an oil that comes from the oil palm tree, um, and the oil palm is indigenous to West and Central Africa. Um, it's a, it's there's an oil palm fruit. It's about this big. It's about the shape of a plum, but it's like bright. Can be yellow. It's mostly orange. Can be sort of yellow to red. Um, and you get actually two oils from it. So there's this orange fleshy material from which you get palm oil, and then there's a white kernel, and from that you get another oil called palm kernel oil, um, and it's been used traditionally in Africa for, for cooking, for sort of rubbing, rubbing on the body, um, for lighting lamps. Um, they, they tap the sap to make um, palm wine. They use the, the leaves for, um, for building. Um, but it's, only, it's, it's really it's since sort of the, the turn of the century that it um, has been commoditized. And in particular, as I said, in Southeast Asia, the, the plant brought from Africa over to Southeast Asia these huge, produced on these huge plantations and then sort of has found its way into the, something like 50% of every product on um, U.S. grocery store shelves. Mm -hmm. All right. So you, you, um, you begin the first part of the book called Un Unguent of Empire. Uh, it's the first time I've read the word unguent since, uh, since Latin class. <laughs> um, why did you decide to to dive into the history as opposed to like what a journalist might do is just talk about what's going on now. What, what was, what was the relevance um, I, for you? Like I didn't, I didn't really know that I was going to do that when I started, you know, looking into this, but then I started reading it and I was just fascinated because I had no idea. I had no idea that, um, you know, as I talk about in the book, basically the, the slave trade, the, the infrastructure that was put in place um, for the slave trade in the Niger Delta um, was then used to trade palm oil. And that palm oil was this really important commodity um, in the 19th century. And I just, I was fascinated basically on what I was finding. And then there were also some really inter interesting characters involved in the trade. Um, I talk about George Goldie ma mainly, this aristocratic British guy who got involved, basically went down and um, supplanted all the African traders in palm oil. Um, and then this other guy, William Lever, who was the founder of what would become Unilever, which is still, I think, the biggest buyer of palm oil um, in the world. Mm -hmm. So basically, I just I was fascinated by what I was reading, and I thought other people would be interested in this. I hope. Yeah, and and, and you know, as I was then reading the you know the the contemporary stories, the echoes of the past right. were really really loud. Right. Like, oh, it's, right. it's it hasn't changed. Please change, I say at one point in the book. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, George Goldie's a fascinating guy. You do, you know, you, he comes across originally as sort of this foppish ne'er-do-well, but you do point mm -hmm. out he did have a brilliance to him. And it's, you know, it's kind of a sick joke that this guy was kind of ill-equipped for anything other than 
oh, colonizing Africa and rationalizing from a Western point of view, the, the and he palm didn't oil. Even live there. He went there once, and then he, and then he, you no, know, no, I guess he went there twice. He went there at the end of his career, but he he did this all from London. He was just sort of puppeteering from London, and um, so so not seeing the result of his machinations. Yeah, so he he created the UAC, right? Uh, then the NAC. Um, mm -hmm. And finally, the, the Royal uh, Niger Constabulary. Um, and, you know, reading about like the attacks, the, you know, it kind of reminded me of the, the worst brutality of the rubber trade um, mm -hmm. here in. Very, very similar. Right. Like, OK, so the story is he basically he goes in or his people go in, take whatever they want and use every lever, including horrific violence and threats of violence to essentially enslave an entire population because because uh, they, they have they, they have no choice. Right. Well, one that they also he also had guys who agents who were going around and um, sort of coercing chiefs and kings into signing away, often, you know, flying them with alcohol first and then signing contracts in languages that they didn't understand, which were basically signing over. Yes, my territory will be a, a free trade zone. And then he basically bought off all the, the traders that were working there so that he had, he had this monopoly and um, yeah, basically kicked them out of their own trade. Uh, and, you know, uh, he reminded me kind of of like a lot of sort of Silicon Valley entrepreneurs who are like, oh, I see I see an inefficient system. I'm going to go in and make it more efficient without, right. you know, and I, I don't want I don't want to compare like Airbnb and Uber <laughs> to what he did. But this idea like we're not gonna, even going to think about collateral damage to, right. to human beings because, we, you know, all, all I'm thinking about is extractive efficiency. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's the story of, of the palm oil industry, really. And then William Lever did the same thing in the Belgian Congo. When it went in saying like, oh, I'm, you know, King Leopold was so bad, but I'm coming in after. I'm a Christian. I'm going to build churches. I'm going to build schools. And there was a little of that, but a lot of it was sort of smoke and mirrors. And then when, when people got down to actually report on it, they said it's, it's little improved from the days of King Leopold. Yeah, and that was shocking to be able to trace this guy and this company's wealth to such ill-gotten gains. I guess I, I've been um, sort of sensitized recently by the, you know, the, the coverage around the death of the queen and discussions of, of you know, the royal empire. fortune and right. empire and where it came from. And like, as is, it's an unbroken line into you know, the 50s, 60s, 80s, we're still doing it. We're still uh... totally. I know, and you and you just realize how how recent that history was, and as I say in the book, how history's drumbeats reverberate. Like not only not only is it sort of echoing into what we're seeing today, but actually the the ramifications of what was happening in those times. You know, two two or three generations down, both the people who accumulated the wealth, and both the people who are screwed, their you know their families are reaping the benefits and the damage of that today. Yeah. You know? mm. So, so you know, one one of the interesting bits was sort of how how palm oil changed Euro, a Europe that was ready to be changed by it from the lubrication, the idea, you know, the industrial revolution needed lubrication and it needed soap, mm -hmm. and and just like you know, these sort of it looks like sort of weird historical coincidences that right. that were made possible, and then and then needed lots of processed food. <laughs> no, that's a joke. It didn't need it, but um, they, they found a way to, I mean, I guess th there were growing populations and, and to make this cheap food that you could get out to people there again, palm oil was, was out there ready. Right. Um, so I guess the, the, the historical part ends around the sort of end of the 20th century in Malaysia where I, you talk about uh, like the tree, the tree cover loss. And yeah. do you have the stat? Uh, I, 20, have the I, have well, I have 20 yeah. million acres of tree cover lost in the last 20 years, like as of. Yeah. Have you ever flown over Indonesia or Malaysia? I haven't. Landed in either place. Um, yeah, It's just devastating. There's some pictures in the book. I mean, you, you just fly for miles and miles and you just see, it's either these sort of graphic, you know, um, squared matrices of, of the plantations, or if it's hilly, they sort of curve around. But it's just, as I said, you can fly really for, for hours, and that's all you see. 
you know, maybe maybe little bits of towns in between there are little, you know, factories, but it's just oil palm everywhere. And when you compare it to historical photos, what's the difference? Oh, it used to be, you know, tropical rainforest, just dense, dense foliage. Mm-hmm. I mean, in the meantime, there was um, rubber in that part of the world as well. So a lot of the oil palm plantations did replace rubber. But since there's been just continued massive deforestation for oil palm. Mm. So one, one of the things you write in the book is you want, uh, I think in the, int- the prologue is to, you want to hand the narrative to those without voices. Um, mm-hmm. So I would, I would love to, to just share some of the stories of, of some of the people that you've you know, interviewed and, and, and featured and kind of put their stories in, in, the, in the historical perspective. Um, so what, you know, what, one of them is, um, I guess, Yoki, Hadi Prakarsa. Uh huh. Um, um, he's, he's he's the hornbill specialist. I didn't actually meet him. We just we just um, communicated um, remotely from uh-huh. from Indonesia. But um, yeah, so what? So as I said earlier, I sort of um, pitched magazine stories as a way to help. You know, so this is before I had done the um, proposal for the book. So I pitched magazine stories as a way to subsidize these research trips and and to get sort of deeper and deeper into the subject matter. And I learned about these helmeted hornbills, which are these amazing birds with this big cask on top of their heads. That um, it's it's like this the same. Um, is is it keratin? Would it be keratin? It's the same, um, very similar to ivory, like to elephant tusk ivory. So so there, it's prized among, particularly among the um, Chinese for sort of carving into trinkets and jewelry and things. Anyway, um, so Yoki is an expert in these birds, and these birds are. Um, you know, they live in tropical rainforest. Most of, there's a, a bunch of different species that live in Southeast Asia. There's a couple that live in Africa, but they're mostly in Southeast Asia. Um, so um, some of the guys that I, so I pitched a story to Audubon magazine, the, the magazine about birds, to go look at what's happening with this species of bird um, being critically endangered and how that was linked to the palm oil industry. So Yoki was sort of my, my expert who helped me um, navigate that. But the other people I hung out with when I was over there for that trip were, were these guys who, um, these poachers who shot the, the helmeted hornbills down. Forgive me for one second. I've got a dog begging to get in. <laughs> Come on. You have to be quiet. Sorry. Um, oh, it's okay. We... The children were supposed to supposed to keep the dogs away, but so much for that. Um, anyway, so I hung out. Um, well, there was a guy named Rudy Putra. Who mm-hmm. was um, who? Who grew up in Sumatra, and he, as a young kid, he he was sort of um, enthralled by some of the big animals that live in Sumatra. Among them, um, the Sumatran orangutan, rhinoceros, tiger, uh, and elephant. Um, and he he saw that those they were they were being poached. They were also losing their habitat um, largely to oil palm plantations. So he sort of dedicated his life to. Um, saving them, both in terms of working with um, the people who were poaching and trying to help them finding alternate livelihoods. Um, and so I, I was spending time with him. He also took me into a part of the rainforest that hadn't been cut down to sort of see how things used to be there and, and why it was so important to save this landscape and its incredible biodiversity. Um, but he had, he had interacted with some of these guys who were poaching the birds and so he arranged somehow for these guys to come and talk to me about what they were doing. And yeah, it was, it was kind of devastating. The one guy came in with his big gun. He was, as I said, he sort of made this cocky entrance. He thought he seemed like, you know, he thought he was very cool, but, and they talked just matter of factly about, yes, we, we shoot down these birds. We know they're critically endangered, but we have to feed our families. We don't have any other livelihood. Um, this was in the northern part of Sumatra, Aceh, where there was a, a civil war for a long time, so a lot of people didn't didn't get schooling. Um, and so, yeah, I ended I end that chapter talking about one of them said, you know, we we would like to do anything else. It's not that we want to kill these birds; it's just that we know we can sell them for a lot of money. And one of them said we that he had had his gun um, modified because the 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 four millimeter bullets that that it, that it normally shot didn't always kill the birds on, on um, contact and that it just broke their hearts to see the birds suffer. So he had, he had paid money to have it modified so it would shoot a bigger bullet 
so he could make sure that when he hit the birds that they would die so that he didn't have to watch them suffer. I, if you hadn't brought that up, I was going to mention it because I, you know, I reread, skimmed the book this morning in preparation for our conversation. And when I got to that part, which I hadn't remembered from my previous reading, I cried. Mm-hmm. Like, like this poach is, you know, sort of evil poacher, right? The one who's killing right. the endangered species is exactly. like <laughs> just trying to feed his kids, feed his kids, and and willing to spend some of his money in an act of mercy, and you're really like, like, boy, pointing fingers is a hard thing. And, and we're, we're very likely to be pointing fingers in the wrong directions if we don't understand, you know, the, the, the global picture that you, that you portray here. Exactly, yeah. You know, and, and I think, you know, the, that uh, YouTube um, piece, um, I can't remember his first name, Reg- Regusia. Adam. Adam, Adam Ragusia, Adam he sort of ends it by saying, like, let's, you know, let's not live in moral superiority by having a very easy judgment of, of what's going on. You know, and it's like, you know, being, being part of the Western industrialized world, like, you know, we have a lot to answer for as opposed to like just going around the world and pointing fingers at what all the other people are, are doing wrong. Exactly. Yeah, and also who's who's using all that palm oil? I mean, they they use some there now, but it's like the the lion's share of those processed foods. You know, a lot of it's landing with us, with people in Western countries. Who... Right. So you 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 talk about something that happened in Indonesia in October of 1965, a, uh, a kind of uh, an up, up, uprising or massacre, uh, a laborers' revolt that was that was like mm-hmm. really put, put down. down. By uh, by Suharto, right, um, with, the, with the help of the CIA, right, right. like yeah, like Su- Sukarno was kind of you know like communist friendly, even though the the communist uh-huh. party there had been um, um, illegal for a while. But uh, right. you know, like yeah, the CIA does not want you know communists governments in charge of uh, Wor- workers workers revolting, right, right, and and you know, so that that was that. That was an interesting thing in the book, and it was it was similar. I talk about in Honduras, you know, where the um, a lot of the palm oil is grown on former land that was um, bananas grown by Chiquita before that United Fruit. So there was you know CIA involvement there too. I just I found it kind of fascinating. Uh, you talk about pointing fingers, and then you know in so many of these instances, you can go back and see that the United States was was in there, you know, doing its thing. Yeah, and you know, if you if you saw like last week, you know, when uh, the the you could pay eight dollars for a for a blue check on Twitter, somebody went in and I saw that. Uh, was it Chiquita Banana? We just like overthrown the government of uh, <laughs> yes, of, of, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, that was, I got a kick out of that. Right. So so at that point, now you know. So we've got the CIA implicated in you know through very good sources, but now now the World Bank, which is, you know, devoted, dedicated to ending global poverty, I believe, is, is, is their mission. What do they do? Well, the president, the current president denies climate change. So that, that gives you some idea about, um, you know, how, uh, how far reaching and um, in, in inclusive their, their mindset was. But so, I mean, you know, in their in their defense, it's like you you can't always see you know what what's going to result from the from the measures you take in the future. But the idea was um, to help alleviate poverty. So when um, Indonesia and Malaysia gained their independence, they had these big populations of, of very poor people. Um, so they gave out parcels of land and um, oil palm seedlings and rubber seedlings to to help these peasants. Um, you know, have an income, grow this stuff and have an income. But then it, then it just kept sort of um, multiplying and, and these, this commodity became central to both of their economies, not realizing the impact that it would have on the, on the environment um, and on their diets and on biodiversity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, you, you're, you're right about like what the traditional subsistence diet would have been. And, you know, aside from like, you know, the boar, I think I would have enjoyed all of it. You know, it was very... <laughs> right. Lots of lots of roots and um, seeds and 
greens, fruits, all sorts of fruits. Mm -hmm. yeah. <coughs> but, you know, it's, it's very similar Friends. to sort of like dessert, you know, dessert economies all over the world from bananas to pineapples to coffee that mm -hmm. right, we all this we get all this cheap stuff and the people who are living there can't afford it and no longer, you know, now, they, now they're eating, you know, ramen and, and white flour products because all of their right. subsistence and state lands subsidized are gone. rice. Yeah. Um, yeah. Lots of junk food. As I, as I said, in the, the sort of a lot of these um, oil palm plantations, there would be little villages that were just marooned in the middle of them because the companies had just sort of bought up or stole all the land around. And in so many of these little villages, there would be a little like um, bodega type place uh, with just, just garbage food, you know, all this, all this fried um, chips and crispy things and um, sweets and cigarettes. Not, you know, there, there was nothing, there was no fresh fruits or vegetables in, in these places. So the, the diets were just really garbage. Mm. And, you know, we, in chapter six, Caravan Dreams, like the, the poor diet is sort of the least of people's health concerns. You, op you open the chapter by talking about uh, Walter Bonagas. Mm -hmm. uh, could t tell a little bit about about him. So he he's a, he was a worker um, in Honduras for that company Grupo Harimar, which which was a um, it incorporated I think part of what used to be um, Chiquita if I'm if I'm correct. Um, anyway, it's on it's on land they, they're farming oil palm on land that used to be um, Chiquita bananas. So these, uh, I didn't. I talked about sort of the oil palm fruits. They grow in these big bunches way up in the canopy of, canopy of the oil palm fruits, and people used to sort of shimmy up there and get, take a machete and, and knock them down. These days, they use these long aluminum poles to knock to bonk these big um, bunches of fruit down. So he was doing that, and he sort of slid into. Um, I don't know. I can't remember if it had rained or if they just watered the plants. Anyway, he got he got electrocuted using this thing. So when I met him, his, one of his arms sort of cut off here and he had like skin grafts and, um, scars all over his, his chest and his, and his legs. Um, his friends, I talked to some friends who had been with him and they said he just like exploded in, the, in a ball of fire and they were in the middle of the plantation. So it was, a, it was, there was no, they didn't have any vehicles there. They had to like fly somebody down to get a car and then get him to um, a clinic and then to an actual hospital where they could handle all these like, very intense bruises. Um, so I talk about that and then just a lot of, there's a lot of other health issues that come with um, working these jobs. They're, they're around harsh chemicals, um, uh, paraquat and what's the roundup one? Yeah, glyphosate. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So they're 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 handling these these harsh chemicals. They say they've got stinging eyes, skin issues. Um, the women in Indonesia have, have been documented that they've they've got collapsed uteruses from carrying these these heavy fruit bunches and um, and mm -hmm. sacks of um, oil palm fruits. So you know, not just health issues. Um, then then they also said there's like the 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 company is so cheap that it won't pay for enough workers to sort of clean up around the trees so that so you get snakes in that undergrowth and they and they some of them are issued boots but they said they're these cheap boots that the snakes can bite right through so, so some of them have died from um, snake bites and so they tried to organize against Grupo Harimar and then a lot of them were harassed or fired for for trying to um, you know get better concessions from the company. Yeah, you talked about the uh, like the PPE that was sort of given that do either doesn't fit or doesn't work, or actually, you know, the, the gloves that are made of natural materials that kind of soak it up and make things worse. Right. Um, and the goggles, they said, they said you try these on. You can't wear them in like eighty degree heat; they get all fogged up. You can't you can't do the job that you're meant to do with these with the kind of goggles that they gave them. Um, and in you know, the same chapter, you talk about human trafficking um, of people to the Malaysian plantations because the Malaysian people, by and large, are, are too well off to want to do that work. Right. And a much smaller population than Indonesia. So, yeah, they, they get people in from some of the Indonesian islands, from um, Myanmar, India, Bangladesh. Um, and, you know, in some cases, they want to come and get these jobs, but in many cases, it's sort of... Um, coerced labor and they come under false pretenses and they can have their passports confiscated 
and put up in just just horrific um, conditions. Uh, and basically, yeah, trapped there. Like they don't have identification papers, so they can't get out. All right. And you also talk about um, child labor, sexual abuse. That this is these are extremely um, marginalized and disempowered people. Mm. And so remote. I mean, that's, I also talk about, so that Liberia story, um, it was like eight hours to get to the, the plantations on really awful roads. And the same, you know, so much of my reporting in all these places was just like driving on these, these really bad roads to get to these very remote places. And that's partly why, as I say in the book, why the industry can get, a, get away with this because, um, you know, there's just a real lack of oversight because who's going to, who's going to get out there. It's not, you know, journalists on occasion, sort of watchdog groups on occasion, but um, that workers told me in, in Honduras and in Indonesia, like, oh yeah, they know when they're coming, when they're coming, we can talk about, there's this, something called the um, round table on sustainable palm oil, which is supposed to monitor the industry. And they say, yeah, oh, they, they, they you know, the company knows when the inspectors are coming. So, so they hide us like way back there, or they tell us this is what we're supposed to say. So, um, you know, a lot goes on that that is not known about unless somebody's like really making an effort to um, get there and like spend a lot of time there, which also isn't easy because there's guards on these plantations and, you know, the workers are being intimidated. So they're afraid to, to talk to journalists and it's complicated. All right. And you, you talk about a, a 2015 wall street journal article on the conglomerate FGV um, which, you know, the issue from, you know, for, from, the, from my perspective as a consumer is I don't, you know, I don't want to participate in a supply chain that involves sexual abuse, child labor, slavery, trafficking, um, you know, union busting, intimidation. And yet you, you they talk about these, the palm oil is, you know, we can trace it pretty much to Nestle, Johnson and Johnson, Colgate, mm -hmm. Palmala, Procter and Gamble, Kellogg's, Mars, Pepsi, L'Oreal, ADM, Cargill, like companies that are just, you know, everywhere in our lives. That there, there, there's right. very, right. there's but, very but little but supply it, chain transparency. Yeah, but it, right, and it takes a lot of, of um, effort on the consumers' part to, you know, to go in and track. I mean, I did it for for my reporting, but to go in and track like what mill is this going to, and then what refinery, and then where do those exports go to. Um, FGV, in fact, it, uh, the, the U.S. government a year ago, two years ago, um, stopped imports of, of palm oil from FGV, Feldman Global Ventures, um, specifically on, um, on labor abuse charges. So I don't, I don't think that's mm. been re reinstated. I haven't checked. But um, so there, there were reports on that, credible reports, and, they, and so they, they – the border patrol said um, we're not getting imports from this company anymore. So mm. uh, something. Uh, and the and the other way I feel personally implicated as an American is you know the in the history of um, United Fruit and the CIA they hired uh, the propaganda guy right Edward Ber Bernays uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, to to convince us that the. The, the fruit company and the, you know, were the good guys and these laborers, peasant laborers were the bad guys. Uh -huh. Which same, same thing. I mean, there's a, um, one of the, the big companies in um, Honduras, Dinant. I get emails from their PR guy all the time telling me about all the great stuff they're doing. And these guys were, um, they were implicated in, in many deaths in maybe 2015. There was lots of clashes with the, with the peasants there. And, um, in fact, the World Bank had been um, loaning them money and then cut it off because of these uh, very credible reports of murders by by their guards and other folks connected with the company. Um, and then, as I say in the book, so the Malaysian palm oil um, industry is the, super, somehow more aggressive than the, than the Indonesian one. I guess it's a, sort of a hangover from history, but they are like they go after critics um, very strongly and they tend to call them neo-colonialists. -colonial like, who are you to, to tell us poor people, you know, what to do? And then in the course of my reporting, I learned that this, this whole campaign about the neo-colonialists um, had been, um, it was a, firm, a US lobbying firm, um, PR firm, 
in DC that had come up with this campaign um, and was paying, being paid more than a million dollars to do it. Um, so, you know, the whole campaign is like, how can you, how can you tell us what to do? And you, and you're not, um, you're discounting, you know, the livelihoods of all these smallholder farmers. So it's all about like, it's the, it's the poor smallholder farmers and who are you rich Western people to, you know, screw with their lives. Um, but the fact is that these smallholder farmers are like living on the poverty line, if that, and the, the real money of the industry is very concentrated still in among, a, you know, like 10 big companies. Um, the Indonesian ones in particular run by, run by, you know, the next generation of folks who were Suharto cronies. So it's, it's still that, that wealth is still very concentrated and the power in the industry is still in the hands of a very few so th this idea that like it's the it's the small holders that are that are losing out if you you know criticize the industry is is bullshit um, you know <laughs> calculated by this this PR firm in Washington D.C. lobbying firm. Yeah, well, uh, one of the shocking anecdotes you share is you're you're at this conference of uh, on global health around you know obesity and chronic disease, and the Malaysian Minister of Health gives this rousing speech about bad diet, and then you want to interview him, and they say, oh, well, he can talk about everything except palm oil. I couldn't believe it when the guy said that. Yeah, and then he just then he just goes to me. I never got to interview him. He was like, no, she's, she wants to talk about palm oil. Um, right. He had been very friendly up until that. Yeah. So how, how much of your access depended on you for lack of a better word, lying about what you were writing about? I didn't have to do, I mean, I did do it um, when I went undercover in Indonesia. I was, I was with a group called Eyes on the Forest. And when I got there, somehow they, they were worried that we, were, we would get stopped and I needed, to, I needed to be able to show people like why I was there. So I did pretend there, I, I went in to meet like the um, sort of municipal head, I don't, I don't know exactly what his title was, but I did go in with my binoculars, like saying that I was there to see the helmeted hornbills and the orangutans. Mm. Um, otherwise, I mean, I guess I was prepared to lie, but I didn't. I didn't really have to because I didn't. Um, mm. No, I guess I didn't. I didn't. Um, I didn't always write journalists. Like when I, if I had to get a visa, I just said I was going as a um, as a tourist, mm -hmm. to not sort of raise alarm bells. That's you now. That's a tricky thing because if you get caught, you're really screwed. But um, uh, I guess that's it. I'm, tr I'm trying to remember in other places. I just, I just tried to, you know, fly under the radar, basically. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, I was, a, I was a little prepared to lie, but I, but I really only did it in that instance in um, Sumatra. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the eyes on the forest and the, the, the person you call Wawan? Because um, as, as I was reading that part, I was like, boy, you could, you could write like, you know, Tom Clancy style, you know, Robert Bourne. Uh, Robert Ludlum, like fiction, like this, like the things they had to go through. It felt like so like inside baseball about how to, amazing. how to do this work. Can you talk about that? So, yeah, they've been at it a couple of years. Um, the, the lead one in particular. So they, they go undercover, they pretend they're like, um, they work for maybe WWF or that they're like, they want to buy land. I think they, they even would, would say that they worked for the oil palm industry. So basically what they're trying to do, is figure out who's growing oil palm in illegal places. Mostly it's like in um, national parks or on peatlands where you're not supposed to be planting it or sort of clo close to a river um, or on land that you know should be owned by a village but um, a company's just sort of gone in and taken over. So they go in and, and pose as these, um, in these various different guises. And I tell the story at one point, we're sort of, we're driving, again, this is in Sumatra, just like, way far away from much of anything and we saw a guy sitting next to his truck with um, with all the oil palm fruits mounted up above and, and we might have been i think we were inside a national park at that point so we knew that he had harvested them or he'd gotten them from somebody who'd harvested them inside the national park so they just sort of um they pulled up and he went out and um this guy as i said he was he was kind of like a he was a total mensch these guys were like hunched over their computers half the time doing and like figuring out their drones and, and getting photography and, but also that out in the field, they just started like playing this game. So anyway, he, he walked up to the driver and he just started like small talking with him. He said like, is this where you see the tigers? And then he was like, Oh, how's your, 
how's your harvest? Where are you taking it? And the guy said, I'm taking it to, I think it was Tebow, like a town nearby. And he said, oh, I have an uncle who lives in Tebow. What's like, what's the guy's name? Your trader. And then the guy, and he was like, that's the same name as my uncle. <laughs> like, yeah. You know, extracting all this. And meanwhile, the other guy's taking pictures of his um, license plate. And um, yeah, it was very funny to see because when I said these, these are, this, this guy was like very straight otherwise. And to just see him just start like, you know, totally lying and getting all this information. Um, they were very clever. And that was another time we were sort of, when we were stopping, we were stopped waiting for some other so a lot of what what i did with them was like basically track um these trucks that were transporting the palm oil so we would see if they were coming from a, um, inside a national park or some other restricted area and then sort of try to follow them without seeing that we were following them so at one point we were we were like we knew this truck was there getting fruit from an illegal place so we were just sort of staked out waiting for him so then we could pull up behind him but they said you know if anybody comes we, you know, say we have a flat tire or say we're having trouble, um, engine trouble and we're, you know, we're just waiting for like somebody to come and help us. Um, yeah, they were, mm -hmm. they were amazing characters. And I, as I said, there were like, five, I think it was five guys and or four guys and two drivers. All these guys, Indonesian didn't speak any English. There's one who spoke kind of a little English. Um, and I couldn't, I couldn't hire my own fixer because this was all undercover and they didn't want to like anybody else. So I was just using their interpreter. Um, and it, we were together, I think, for like four or five days. So it was, a, it was an adventure. Wow. And you also talk about um, they have to change their shirts when they're on the motorcycle. Right, and you have, right, to, you have to, right. to swap out four by fours and change license plates. Like very right. James Bond, right? Yeah, that's what I was saying. So as I said, they're like, they're, tr you know, riding behind these trucks, tr ch tracing them, but they don't want the trucks to know that they're the same guys. So yeah, they would, they would change their, the color of their shirts and swap out. <laughs> The, the license plate swapping, I think, was actually the um, the guys who drive the, who were driving the trucks, because they they knew that you know they might be um, they were going to bring illegal fruit to a certain mill or something, and they didn't want to be caught, so they would change the license plates. I think, mm. if I remember correctly. Gotcha. And was your family worried about you on these trips, or did you like not tell them everything? <laughs> I didn't tell them everything, but it's very funny because. Um, my son, who's a senior in high school, he, so I'm, I'm working on something else right now. And I, and about two weeks ago, I said, did I tell you that I'm taking a trip for work? And, and he said, no, where are you going? I said, well, I'm going to um, Brussels and Paris and Prague. And he started cracking up and he said, I love how your travel has changed. It, it used to be like, I'm going undercover in Honduras and there's like a 60% chance that I'll get murdered. But now I'm going to Paris and Prague. <laughs> So I guess they sort of knew. I um, you know, it was those Honduras. It was that Honduras trip, which I I canceled it like two different times because I was just like, I didn't I didn't feel like I had all the pieces in place in terms of security and yeah, it was just like that was Honduras and Guatemala are kind of scary places to go. I mean, you know, you can go to Guatemala tourist areas. I think are, are pretty safe, but where I was in both of those places were a little scary, as I say in the book, because a lot of it is is bound up with the drug trade. Mm -hmm. So um, I think life is pretty cheap in those places. So they sort of knew. Um, I would kind of downplay it when I was at those places, I think. But maybe when I came uh -huh. home, I'd say that was scary. Uh -huh. <laughs> Why did you do it? Um, I really I really thought, like, no, nobody knows about this stuff, and it's everywhere. Um I really, as I, as I said, like in that time in the Peace Corps, I lived in this little village right on the equator. And then I went to Liberia and saw this. It was also little villages right on the equator. It looked very similar to mine. And I thought, I just thought like all these people are getting screwed for, and it's also like screwing public health and it's screwing the, you know, both in terms of biodiversity, climate change. I like, I, I really, and I, I really felt like it matters. Um, and, you know, it's nice to do work that you think matters. Mm, and it yeah, was interesting. I, it was really interesting. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, I kept as I was reading it, I kept on trying to think about what it must have been like for you to write it, and I think it was easier for me to do that because I know you, right? It uh -huh. wasn't just like oh, some author, like oh, this is a real person who right. like went through like first of all this the the pain of having to read about things you didn't see, and then putting yourself in danger and and witnessing like tragedy after tragedy yeah it's uh. i mean 
as I also say in the book, you know, I, I came home to Brooklyn, you know, to, um, so, you know, lucky me that I, that I get to live this sort of safe, privileged life, but um, a lot of people don't. And as I said, I, I, it was definitely the, the time in Peace Corps that made me think like, oh shit, this is like how most of the world lives and nobody knows. And like, we're just living our lives blindly doing the things we do and not realizing like how it's impacted people on the other side of the planet. So it, it was kind of, um, you know, a privilege to, to be able to do something that I felt like, you know, benefited, like, if not the people in my village, those kinds of people who, you know, as I say, like, don't generally get much of a voice. Mm -hmm. uh, so chapter 10 has some good news. <laughs> Right, uh -huh. the fight the power. Um, so you talk, talk about the uh, the Girl Scout activists because they, they those two girls seem to have done more than than almost anyone. I know, Am amazing, right? So these Girl Scouts, I can't remember what year it was, a while ago in the eighties, I think. So, um, well, uh, yeah, go ahead. originally, because that that was the thing when I started when I got this idea, I thought like palm oil. The only thing I remember is like something about Girl Scouts and orangutans. Did you remember that? Like I had, I had some idea in my head that I had remembered. Yeah. That. No, um, I, that wasn't on my radar. So these Girl Scouts were do, we were doing something to get a, a badge in, I don't know if it was biodiversity or something about the environment, I think. And so they had done like a research program or maybe it was an orangutans. They'd done a research program on palm oil and its impact on the, I think the habitat of the orangutans. Um, they were, I think like 14 at the time. I'm not, I'm not positive. Uh, and then they started doing research, more research into palm oil, and they realized, like, oh, palm oil is in all the Girl Scout cookies, which are made by which are made by Kellogg's, and these kids happen to be in Michigan. So then they they started trying to like um, write letters to Kellogg's. They were a little bit ignored at first. Somehow they ended up hooking up with um, an organization called Mighty Earth in D.C. that sort of helped them. The the organization was like, oh, we've got these adorable girls. They're talking about orangutans. They're talking about Girl Scout cookies, like. You know, this is the way a way that we can we can finally get attention to this really important thing like deforestation and tropical rainforests and climate change. Um, so they sort of helped them, like give them some media training, and I think helped them get get hooked up with journalists. Anyway, then these girls were on Good Morning America and the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and People Magazine, and so got got a lot of publicity. And then what happened was the the guy from Mighty Earth and um, a guy from another organization they had already been in talks with one of the main, with Wilmar, the, the biggest oil palm trader based in Singapore, um, trying to get the traders to say like, okay, we're not gonna trade um, oil palm oil that's um, linked to deforestation. But they weren't really getting much traction. The guys were like, yeah, 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 we'll do that. But then they were like, you know, you've got all these protesters now outside of, of Kellogg's and, you know, Americans are starting to wake up to this and your consumers, we can link this, you know, this, this stuff at Kellogg's to your company and so you need to so it was sort of the the leverage that they had in saying you know people are waking up to this and and you're the companies that you're selling to are going to be screwed and you're going to be stuck you know with no one to sell your palm oil to so that sort of put the leverage on the traders and then and they um so then they signed like a, a no deep no deforestation no peat development on peat um uh what's the word i want you know, they vowed not to do that anymore. So it was it was those Girl Scouts that, um, with the help of this other organization, sort of ended up being the perfect vehicle to like bring this message to the public. Right, and you know, so given given that message and given the um, that deal between uh, Glenn Hor Horowitz and um, mm -hmm. uh, Quack, I think was uh, the right. person he, he was Quark. meeting with. Um, like again, we have the issue of supply chain, right? Like how. Uh, how confident are you that that these aren't just you know words on paper? Um, I, you know, Glenn Horowitz is um, so that Mighty Earth, that organization, they have since um, started this thing. I forget what it's called, but they've got like satellites all over. It's like a rapid mo rapid um, monitoring system. So they've mm. got their eyes on like what's going on, and if they see deforestation. The, their idea was if we get to the the traders like you know there are all these different um, palm oil companies but they all they they go through not that many traders that then distribute it to these companies so they thought if we can get the traders you know hold the traders feet to the fire then we're gonna 
then that that's the way to sort of deal with it better. So what they do is if the, if they see deforestation, they get in touch with the um, the trading companies that they know that palm oil is going to go to, and they say, you know, you need to cut that off immediately, or you know, we're gonna we're gonna do lots of media about how you're trading um, palm oil linked to deforestation and peat development. So um, I th I think they're doing a pretty good job, and I, and it has um, had an impact on deforestation. That said, there is leakage. I mean, there there are um, there are companies that just don't don't care, and they and they know, you know, maybe if they they're not going to find their market in the states or in Europe, they can always find a market in in China or Pakistan or India where consumers aren't, mm -hmm. you know, tend not to care as much about tend not to have the let's say to have the luxury to care as much about um, you know environmental concerns or human rights concerns. So I think it's I think it's helped. I don't think it's like you know. Foolproof. It's not like um, tight, tight thing. Mm. Yeah. Uh, well, in, in the epilogue, which you, you you said like I didn't think I was going to write this epilogue, but the pandemic happened, and so uh -huh. let's let's talk about it. Um, you know, you do offer um, ideas about what we can do, but like palm oil is, you know, it's at the center of a lot, but it's also a com a symptom of right. of lots of other. Structures. What? What? You know. Now, to, you know, two years on from the beginning of the pandemic, uh, when you have a sort of a, a lot more um, perspective and hindsight, what do you think we need to do? But you know, as you and me and people who are listening, as you know, citizens and consumers, and what 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 kind of policy changes could really make a difference? I was very heartened to see. Was it yesterday or the day before? Finally, like developed countries said, "Okay, we're gonna um, we're gonna help you know fund poor countries being um, impacted by climate change." I think that I think like I think the thing the same thing happens needs to happen. It started to happen a little bit, but in a much bigger way in terms of um, deforestation and biodiversity. I think I think you know we sitting here in in New York, um, Paris. London need to realize like it's not a problem that's over there you know if if climate change you know if we don't get a, a hand handle on climate change if we don't stop this you know um, biodiversity loss um, deforestation we're all screwed all you know all our lifestyles are are going to go away so I think and realizing you know historically we've we've taken extracted so much wealth from these places that we need to keep put both the history in perspective and also the hope for a future. And, and in that way, like say, yeah, we need to, we need to pay the Congolese to keep the rainforest um, standing, pay, mm. pay the Indonesians, you know, not so much tell them you need to keep your rainforest standing, but say it's in our interest and we're willing to, you know, negotiate with you so, to, so that we can save the planet basically. Mm. That's the main thing. I think like take, take responsibility both for what's happened historically um, you know, and for like what we want to happen in the future and, and take steps to, to make it happen in a way that like takes into consideration, okay, there are all of those, um, oil palm farmers and they're going to, if you're going to, you know, stop growing this much oil palm, you're going to need to help them to transition to something else, help ensure that they have livelihoods. Um, it's complicated, <laughs> but <laughs> it's very complicated. It's not just like, I'm going to stop using palm oil, right? Yeah, it really is an issue of of, of equity, right? Like everyone mm -hmm. in the world, you know, needs to be able to live, or else we, you know, if if we've created or we have inherited systems in which people are so impoverished that they'll do anything to survive, we can't criticize them for what they do to survive. Exactly, including cutting down trees and you know shooting um, primates because they're starving for meat. Mm -hmm. So you, you end the book talking about a trip and, I, and, and you're very good at, at, as a travel writer of talking about like you took, you know, this was the, the boat you took and see what you saw on the side. And like these are very long trips. As you say, you go into remote areas. But the last trip you, you write about, it almost felt like, I don't want to say frivolous, but like extra, extra, extra. Like, you're, you know, you're going to Honduras, you're going to like reporting. You go to Lusanga. To, in the Congo to look at an art project, and I'm I'm curious what that meant to you. Well, do you know what, what Lusanga used to be? You, you know what Lusanga was called before and after? No. Uh, or no, it was, it was Lusanga. Then it was Leverville. So it was one. It was one of those concessions that William Lever had gone, um, 
and it was it was the main place where he had first started growing his palm oil and when where he said he built this you know um uh, utopian village named after himself so that was leverville it's now gone back to lusanga um and i had read about this because because the art project it's very interesting there was actually a, a feature about it and the guy in the new yorker about um two months ago so his his whole idea is um basically upending you know these systems that that we've been talking about and um helping the Congolese to, I mean, he talks about like, as you said, it's like these people are so poor, they don't even have the luxury to, to appreciate art. They don't even have like art in their lives because they're just, they've just basically been abused for centuries and, you know, just getting by. And so what he did was he went to this place, Lieberville, now Lusanga, um, and is helping those artists to get their art out into the world and to make money in order to buy back the land that had been stolen from them um, centuries ago and get rid of all the oil, the, the monoculture oil palm plantation and, and institute sort of agroforestry systems that would help restore the land, help them have um, healthy diets, help them make money. So it was, it's like more than just an art project. It's, it's, it's much his, his idea. And this is sort of his life's work is like, you know, upending this whole colonialist system, um, system where, you know, part of the world gets to enjoy art and <coughs> cappuccinos afterward and all um, at the expense of these folks who have nothing. Right. And, and you know, I think there's some, some photos of some of the artworks and you describe mm -hmm. some of it that this is, you know, there's a lot of, of depth and meaning specific, like it's art about this colonial history and what exactly right what their parents and grandparents suffered right. like it's very expressive the word for lever yeah yeah it was really interesting it was it was a long it was a long ways to get there but um it was fascinating yeah it was a, it was a beautiful spot right. so um the book's been out for like a year now mm -hmm. um what have you seen it like um do in the world you know it's um you know, I didn't. I didn't expect much from it, frankly. It's it's done pretty well. It's gotten. It was um, shortlisted for the um, Helen Bernstein Award, which is the the um, New York Public Library's award for um, nonfiction, which was kind of exciting. I you know gave it some exposure. I lost to the woman who wrote um, Invisible Child, as I knew I would. She also won the Pulitzer, <laughs> but um, and it got a, it got an award from the. Um, environment of uh, the society of environmental journalists and another nod from like a nature writing um award so you know i think those things help you know get more readers but what's been interesting is it's it's it keeps to get it keeps getting um attention from overseas which is really gratifying like um so folks in india i did a, I did a podcast with one or two and then i think other people saw that so then they asked me to do a tedx talk mm. and um you know, so there's that, that the chapter on public health mm -hmm. is reported from India, mostly about India, because that, because India is the number one um, importer of palm oil. Um, so anyway, it's, um, you know, it's not a bestseller, <laughs> didn't expect it to be, but I think um, it does seem to continue to get um, interest from different parts of the world, which is, which is nice. Um, mm. And, you know, my hope was just to sort of educate people that, that this is an issue and, I think that's happening. There was another um, palm oil book written by a historian at the university. It was published by University of North Carolina Press, I think. Um, it's called The Oil Palm. It's it's sort of much um, denser history. It's amazing. It's it's full of incredible information. But that came out a couple months after mine. So, like the um, London Review of Books, they they reviewed the two together, uh -huh. um, which was nice. So I think it's like, you know, it's it's put the topic on on people's radars. So that's a nice thing. Great. Um, yeah, as I said, you know, it's, I mean, first of all, it's, it's so well written. Um, Thank you. Just... Miss O'Flaherty. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know that everyone in that class could have written that book. So I, get, I think, I think you're, you're forced to take a little credit. It's just, it's, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a very lively read. It's very literate without being, you know, pedantic it's it was just so you know well, like that's so nice thank you 
like, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's like everyone needs to read this book. Like this is one of the most important books about a, a topic. And like this, you know, like when I think about the books that I've written, the amount of prep and work that I've done to write them has been so much less. Like it's just, you know, they're different beasts, but like what you, yeah. like the, 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 the time, energy, expense, risk you put into this is, is truly remarkable. And, um, you know, I'm just so honored to be able to sit here with you and talk about it. Well, right back at you. I really appreciate your interest. Thank you. Oh, and your good yeah. questions. Yeah. So, so what are you working on next? Um, I have a story um, for Smithsonian Magazine that is overdue. So when I, when I hang up with you, I'm going to go finish that and <laughs> file that today. Um, it is about, there's a, there's a link with the um, Belgian Congo, but it's, but it's not environmental. It's about um, some women who were um, basically abducted from their, they were, they had African mothers and uh, either Congolese or Rwandan mothers and European fathers and so under the under the times of during the time of the Belgian Congo you know it was very regimented um racially with rules for the whites and rules for the blacks and they weren't supposed to be um you know having sex basically and so when these mixed race children were born they basically abducted them from the houses be, between the ages of two and four they were keeping track of them when they knew that they could go to the bathroom on their own they took them and then they brought them to um, Catholic missions, where these where these nuns raised them in pretty like horrific conditions. The, the Catholic nuns being paid by the Belgian state to, to keep these kids. Um, anyway, so there are five. There are these five women who they're in their seventies now. They were taken um, the first one in 1948 up to 1953 and raised in this um, mission in the Belgian Congo. Uh, and they are now suing the Belgian government for crimes against humanity. Mm. So that's the story I'm working on. That's why I was uh, in, in Brussels and Paris. Oh, <laughs> uh, uh, that's that's where the records are. Well, that's where the women are. Oh, okay. Well, so it's that. I'm also working on uh, research for a new book, and there's a woman in Paris. Um, it's a biography. The woman is dead, but there's an 83 year old woman in Paris who knew her. So I've been going back to interview this woman in Paris for that. Wow, wow, yeah. Now I remember when we were, we were chatting earlier, I went and read that that article. Uh, uh, fascinating, um, right? About the the lost children of Spain. Oh right, right. Devastating, isn't it? My God, I I couldn't believe that article. Yeah. So this yeah. one is, has a lot of uh, this this piece Smithsonian piece has a lot of um, sort of echoes of that. Catholic yeah, stealing babies. <laughs> yeah, and with you know, with like the 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 news over the last week, just this question of like, how do people convince themselves to do the things they do? Whether it's you know the crypto yeah. guy or Elizabeth Holmes, like it's a, it's know. fascinating. It, and and would I be any and story. would I be any different? Like, do I have any? You know, like, <laughs> am I just fortunate that I was never put in a position where I had to do, go through those kind of moral gymnastics? Or maybe I have, and I just don't even know it. Yeah, it's 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 very interesting. Um, anyway, it's these these um, women are all grandmothers now, and they were like they had never even told their kids their stories because so they were they were with these nuns, and then um, independence came, and the nuns and the priests just bailed, and so they left these little girls on their own. So they were oh. at the at the mercy of um, you know militias and just horrible things happened to them. Um, and so they're very brave. They've, they've told these stories and their, their lawyer who's a, a, in Brussels, she also said when they came in and they told their stories, it was the first time. And she said they, they had they couldn't even tell their children. And he, and she said, that's the trauma. I saw the same thing. Um, or I, I, you know, heard about the same thing with the Holocaust and saw the same thing with the um, Rwandan genocide. These women, could talk about like seeing their husbands murdered and seeing their sons murdered, but they never talked about how they'd been raped and like what happened to them. It was just like, so mm -hmm. same with these women who, several of whom were also raped. Uh, anyway. Well, th thanks for bringing that to the world. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, yeah. So I need to go and finish it. <laughs> all right. Well, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, uh, I'll let you go same, then. Same old story with me. I'm, I'm uh, you know, 
Thank you for saying my writing is good. It only happens under the you know the worst pressure when the when the guilt has gotten too much. Right, right, yeah. No, de- dead deadlines are our nasty friends. <laughs> yeah, so gotta have them. It's not gonna happen <laughs> otherwise. Right, but so... generally, for me, it happens after the deadline. Unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> well, they're they're out in the world, so they're making and they're making they're making anyway, a difference. So thank you so thank much. Thank you, Howie. Lovely if, to see you. You too. If people want to follow you and your career and your work, where sh- is there a place? Um, yeah, my website is jocelynczuckerman.com. Okay, spell um, spell that. It's J O C E L Y N C Z U C K E R M A N. Um, right. And um, Twitter, I don't tweet that much, but occasionally Jocelyn Zook. Who knows if that'll be there tomorrow anyway, right? Right. <laughs> All right, well, well, we'll we'll find some other place. So, um, thank you so much, Jocelyn. Thank thank you. Like this, this really feels like a a, a work of of heroism to to bring this thank to the you. world. And I'm so grateful to know you and to uh, to be able to um, follow your work. Thank you. Same, and I'll see you at the high school reunion next year. Right. All right. Go Cougars. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>